Okay, before we go on to the next chapter, talk a little bit about some of the weirder stuff that happens in the animal kingdom. Got to get my stories in, and this is a relatively short chapter anyway, so hopefully it'll wind up being a shorter video, which I'm always trying to do, but not usually that successful at doing. Uh, there's a very small group called the thorny-headed worms, the canthocephalans, which literally means thorny-headed, um, and they're parasites. And this also happens in other parasite groups. Uh, I'll give you an example after I talk about the example here. These guys, like a lot of parasites, go through a couple of different hosts. <clears throat> so far as I know, they don't do alternation of generations. They just use a larval form and an adult form. But very often the thorny-headed worms will in the larval form be in some sort of little crawly guy. Some, uh, in the, the example that I know of, um, uh, what around here we call so bugs or potato beetles or potato bugs or armadillo beetles. They're not beetles, they're not actually insects, they're crustaceans, we'll talk about those when we talk about arthropods. But the larvae live in these guys. And uh, somebody suspected that the presence of the larvae was changing the behavior of the host. The final host for this particular species was uh, birds. I forget what kind of bird it was, but a bird that nests up in a tree. They don't all, as you know from the evolution lab. Uh, and this is the test that they ran. This is a great test. Put ladders up against trees where there were nests for the birds and set themselves up in a hide where they could hide from the birds. Parent birds fly away to get food. The researchers scurry up the ladder, individually take the baby birds out of the nest and tie a thread around their necks, not so tight that it would choke them, but tight enough that they couldn't swallow something as big as uh, a sow bug stuffed into their mouths by the parents. Then they go back into the hide, the researchers. And the parents would flop in, the babies would go beep, 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 and the parents would don't, 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 would stuff stuff into their mouths and then go flying off look for more food. And uh, the researcher would go uh, up the tree, take individual baby birds out, un um, turn them upside down over a collecting thing, and uh, you know, everything that they couldn't swallow goes into the collecting thing. They would untie the thread, take anything out that wasn't a cell bug and stuff it down the baby's throat so they were getting fed, tie the thread back, put it back in the nest. So they were just collecting the cell bugs. They'd already gone around the environment and collected a bunch of cell bugs. You know, you turn rocks over, they're, they're, they're there. You don't see them in the open very much. There were way more infected cell bugs being fed to the birds than there were out in the general population. The proportion was just hugely higher. And if you were looking for so bugs and you happened to find them out in the open, they were much more likely to have uh, these thorny headed worm larvae in them than not. And these guys actually do something to these hosts that make them typically, a lot of things that live under stuff have this instinct to, if they, if light gets thrown on them, they scurry into the dark, right? You see that a lot. These guys were reversing that instinct to making them go out into the open where they were much more likely to be picked up by uh, birds and fed to the babies. There are tapeworm larvae that do the same thing. Um, there's a tapeworm uh, where the intermediate host are ants and the final host are sheep. And uh, so the tapeworm larvae reproduce asexually in the ant. When a certain population is there, some of them go up into the ant's head and eat four particular cells in the ant's brain. And that reverses their hide in the dark instinct to go to the light. And so the ants will try to go to the sun. They climb up the grass, they sit at the top trying to reach the sun. If you're trying to get into sheep, that's a great way to get the, uh, the larvae into the sheep. 
And there's a lot of um, similar things. Now with these guys, they're not physically affecting, you know, they're not eating brain cells or anything. They're doing something chemically to reverse the, uh, the instinct. And so that makes these guys an interesting focus of research because when you're spraying pesticides, one of the tricky things about that is that most of the things you're trying to kill are under the plants. They're not in the ground, but they're under the leaves where the pesticide doesn't settle very well and they don't, don't get exposed to it much. If you could pre-spray a chemical that would make those guys come out into the open and then follow with pesticide, the pesticide would be much more efficient. And so they're trying to see if they can find a chemical that would do that. So far, nobody has, but, uh, but it's a weird, interesting way that research goes. In biology, you always get these trees of life showing ancestry and showing um, you know, descendants and who's related to whom by who's on what branches. This is a cartoon one done many, many years ago by the guy who does The Simpsons. This is long before The Simpsons. The Simpsons were sort of cartoon characters and some of these guys, this guy's cartoons. But uh, no. this is, and you've got things on it like sponges and leeches and flatworms and salamanders. Uh, and, and then you've got things like TV preachers and tax collectors and telephone company executives. Sponges leads to poets and folk singers and uh, new age therapists. Uh, slime molds down here, jellyfish. Um, rabbits leads to cartoonists. Uh, squids leads to politicians and criminals. This guy has some opinions. There's good old roundworms leading to radio DJs and psychiatrists, also to clams. Uh, baboons lead to nightclub bouncers and tow truck drivers. Uh, apes lead to humans, post-nuclear mutants, teenagers, and smug urban shoppers. Uh, warthogs lead to bosses and bosses' assistants. There's a lot of stuff on here. But the basic basis of a branch of living things that does exist. And again, if you restrict it to just the major groups, the groups that we're going to talk about, you've got your cnidarians down on the main trunk, you've got your flatworms down on the main trunks, uh, you've got the roundworms that often are a little bit farther up here than this, but uh, this is an old one. But you get the roundworms, also called acelomates, because there's a few different groups here. You got your sponges way down here, the protista, the protozoans way down at the root. And, but then you hit a major branch of the trunk. The protostomes going this way, goes to the mollusks, the uh, annelids, the should, label should be down here, and the arthropods. Then you've got the deuterostomes, that go to the echinoderms, and this is all the chordates. Uh, and so this is what we'll be doing at the end of the semester. We're gonna go up this branch to start, and then come back and go up this branch. There's some major differences between these two branches, so. Now we gotta talk about how embryos develop. Because remember, finding connections between things that don't really look very different as adults, you're much easier, it's much easier to find connections if you look at how their embryos develop and features of the embryos that are homologous between one group and another. And these guys are pretty much related when you start to look at their, um, their embryo development. As I taught embryology, I actually taught vertebrate embryology, embryology for our group many, many years ago. But the very first thing the students looked at under the microscope were sea urchins developing as very early embryos because they're on our branch. And at that stage, very, very early, 
they go through the same sort of developmental stages that we do. That's one of the reasons we know we belong on the same branch together. So, I do write embryo here. Division of cells can be called cleavage. It, it comes from a word, word for, you know, divide. That's why a meat cleaver is called that. Sorry, sometimes if I talk while I'm writing, I don't write right. Um, if you watch, everybody starts as one cell, right? That's the zygote. Sperm and egg get together. You've got a cell with two sets of chromosomes. Bang, that's the genetics for that animal from there on. When the cells start to divide, in the protostomes, every division produces a big cell and a little cell. They're both fully functional cells, but they're not equal in size. And they keep dividing, keep dividing, keep dividing. And so you have this ball you know, they're pulling material in from the yolk so they can do a little bit of growing and then they divide, but they divide unequally, a bigger cell and a smaller cell. And eventually when you get this big ball of cells, the little cells are oriented on the outside and they kind of spiral like a spiral staircase around the outside. And uh, so that's where the idea of spiral cleavage comes from. That's where the name comes from. These guys, when the cells divide, they form two equal sized cells. And they grow a little bit and they divide again and form four equal sized cells. If you're looking down on the division, down on the division, you get a line and you get two cells. And then you get a line and you get four cells. And then you get a line and you get eight cells. So for a while, looking down on it, the division lines look like a radius in a circle. And so that's where the term radial cleavage comes from. I talked about C. elegans, a round worm that always has the same number of cells when it's done making cells. And the research where at the eight cell stage, they know what each of those eight cells is gonna be. At the 16 cell stage, they know what each of those 16 cells is gonna be. That is this type of division where very, very early on, the cells are programmed, okay, you're gonna be this part of the animal, you're gonna be that part of the animal. In our group, the cells stay very flexible, where uh, they're more reading the environment and turning on and turning off different genes in order to be certain cells that they need to be in a particular place. This is why you can take what are called stem cells and put them in a damaged area and they will read the room, they'll, they'll pick up information and turn into the cells that need to replace the cells that are damaged. Also, if something happens and an, uh, a later embryo winds up with a clump pulled off of it or somehow separated off of, from it, in, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong thing. At the protostomes, keep in mind what I'm seeing is reversed from what you're seeing. Uh, in the protostomes, the, uh, that clump was gonna be part of the animal. If it's separated out, that embryo isn't gonna develop properly and it's not gonna survive. In deuterostomes, that clump can become a whole separate, full individual animal. So these guys can become identical twins. That's what happens with an identical twin. A clump of cells separates from the embryo. And because those cells are very flexible, they can still become an entire animal. Here, the clump you separated out was supposed to be part of the final animal, which isn't gonna form properly. And that happens. One other thing about it, so you got this ball of cells. The ball of cells eventually becomes a hollow ball of cells. 
not really a ball very often. It's often sitting on a yoke, so it looks more like a Frisbee. But we always talk about it like it was a ball because it's simple to get that idea across. So this ball, at some point, a dent forms and cells from the outside start to go inside and form a, another layer. So the whole thing shrinks a little bit, but you wind up with an inner layer and an outer layer. You've heard of this, endoderm and ectoderm. The two layers going back to sponges and cnidaria. Ectoderm, endoderm, this is how it forms. And then mesoderm fills in between later on. Uh, and it forms differently in these two groups, but uh, you know, there, there's a lot of differences I'm not gonna get into. I'm not gonna get into that difference either. But that dent forming the endoderm is one of the openings of the digestive system, right? It leads into what's eventually going to be the gut. So it's convenient to have it be either one end or the other. It's just that they're going to be opposite ends. That early opening in the uh, embryo, that first dent that's going to open into the, uh, the digestive system is the mouth opening. Here, it's the other opening. Although in an awful lot of our relatives, that is actually going to be the opening to the umbilical cord that connects you to the yolk. But in theory, it's the anal opening. And so lots of very early differences that separate these two major trunks. So here's the first group on the protostome trunk that we're going to talk about. It includes the snails. Falling in love with a tape dispenser. The mollusks, which can also be spelled with a C at the end. Mollusca is generally the name of the, uh, the phylum. Remember, these are all phylum groups that we're looking at until we get to uh, you know, the really big ones like the arthropods in our chordate group. Um, but there's a basic, now this is a snail, kind of a cutaway of a snail. And there are basic parts of a mollusk that you get. You get a mass inside the body where all the guts are which is called the visceral mass. Viscera is a fancy name for guts. And they've got, you know, lots and lots of guts. They've got a digestive uh, thing and a kidney, and they've got a heart. Coelom is an internal space. They have reproductive organs. Um, they have a nervous system. Uh, they also have a body covering called a mantle. And in an awful lot of mollusks, that mantle generates a shell. Doesn't in all of them. And then they have a mass of muscle called a foot. And this is your basic layout. There's usually, uh, here's your mantle. Very often there's a cavity that the mantle curls around called the mantle cavity. Um, and this is your, your, your basic layout. So they have a visceral mass, and you can fill in what I just told you about that. That's a nice thing about being able to go backwards. Um, they have a mantle and a mantle cavity. Uh, often with a shell. The mantle cavity is very often a breathing apparatus where there could be gills in there, land snails use the surface like it was a lung. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, a, a sperm and eggs tend to be shed through the mantle cavity and sometimes larvae are held there for a while and protected, uh, and sometimes not. Uh, in some animals, 
the mantle cavity is muscular and can be filled up with, uh, with water and then squeezed, and then it shoots a jet out and moves the thing along. You think of how an octopus can swim or squids can swim, but also scallops do that. You know, and that look, they're very clam-like, but they can, they can kind of do, 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 and move themselves along through the water if they absolutely have to. Not too crazy about doing that. Now, when we get into the major subgroups, one of the big things that makes them different is what they do with the foot. And it doesn't say feet because they've got a foot that sometimes gets divided into tentacles, but it's considered to be a single structure. In the more advanced mollusks, and some of them are extremely advanced, they have these weird cells called chromatophores where they can affect the surface of an octopus or a squid for the most part. You do see them in some of the other mollusks, but octopus and squid have the best setup. And there's um, links in the book where you can go and look at videos of these guys uh, you know, blending into a background. They can change their surface and match the colors behind them and match the textures behind them. And they have these cells that, that can affect how light goes in and comes back out. Remember light reflection? And change the colors around them. Is that, here's a crazy thing. You put them on different colored backgrounds, they match the colors. They're, uh, the, the, their input isn't always just through their eyes, is that they're actually picking up uh, light from, uh, uh, in the cells surrounding the chromatophores. But for a long time, is that it was like, well, these guys can't see most colors. And you go, I've seen them match the colors. How can they not see most colors? Well, it turns out our color receptors have certain pigments that react with certain colors. It's like, well, they don't have that, so they must not be able to see certain colors. Well, it turns out their eyes have crystals in them that prism the light, and so it splits the light out to different receptors. The receptors don't need to see the colors, they just need to detect the light's been thrown on them, and that's how they see color. So a green beam hits detectors that are not specifically green detectors, but the only thing hitting them and turning them on is green, so they can match a green background. It's a very neat system, and as I said, there's a number of videos in the book that kind of show you this stuff in action. Uh, Another thing that happens in um, vast majority of mollusks are aquatic, live in the water, some in the ocean, some in fresh water. On land, you're pretty much limited to the snails and slugs, uh, and the other two, the other groups. Uh, who are, you've got the clams and their relatives, they're filter feeders. They were not really built to be in the air. But then you've got the octopus and the squid who have a couple of representatives that have kind of sort of moved into freshwater, but they've never been great at dealing with the challenges of being in freshwater. We talked about that when we talked about the challenges of land. And they're latecomers. And that's probably a really good thing because Octopus and squid, if they had been able to move into freshwater with our fishy ancestors, they probably would have outcompeted them, you know, because they're they, they've got tentacles and you know they're much better at dealing with with moving water and scurrying through the stuff. Uh, they might never have become land animals, but our fishy ancestors didn't have to contend with battling it out with octopus and squid, adapting to to moving fresh water. So we got kind of lucky is that they didn't have to develop the right kind of kidneys the way that, uh, or the right kind of um, waterproofing the way that our ancestors did. On the other hand, octopus and squid are some of the smartest animals in the animal kingdom, is that uh, 
They can learn, but if you show them things, there's a whole bunch of videos online showing them sh giving octopus different tasks and showing them figuring things out. Um, lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. This is still running long. I'm seeing how, how long this is getting. Um, so I'm, I think I'm gonna stop this. We don't have a lot more to do with the, the second one's gonna be a pretty short uh, video, when I, uh, but I'm gonna give you a, a couple of examples of, of, uh, of cephalopod intelligence when we go through the groups.